Dear friends and colleagues from all across the African continent, the Mandela School welcomes all of you to this webinar. Our school aspires to become a world-class African institution inspired by the legacy of Nelson Mandela. We are fortunate in the school to have with us one of Africa's leading thinkers, Professor Carlos Lopez, who has made an immense contribution to our school and teaches in our master's program. He will be moderating the third webinar in this series. Some of you attended the first webinar series that the Mandela School hosted in May this year on COVID-19 and its impact on Africa. The first webinar discussed the question, how can the African Continental Free Trade Agreement stimulate an inclusive and developmental post-COVID-19 economic revival. We are grateful to all of you who raised many interesting questions in that webinar and encouraged us to explore some of these issues in further discussions. One of the key questions many of you raised was the critical importance of building the productive capacity of Africa. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement has to facilitate and enable the transformative industrialization of Africa, not just open markets. The AFCFTA has also to facilitate the spreading of the gains of the AFCFTA to the smaller and more vulnerable economies of Africa. This is a process that I have called developmental regionalism. The idea for this second webinar series emerged from these concerns. Thus, the title of this second webinar series is The AFCFTA and Transformative Industrialization. As Mabel has indicated, for this webinar series, we have built partnerships with like-minded institutions at UCT and other universities and think tanks in Africa. And I will add to the list that she has, uh, uh, she has brought to our attention. And these include the Center for Economic Policy and Development Research at Covenant University in Nigeria. And very importantly, the Nigerian Institute for Advanced Legal Studies, NILES. I must also mention the special partnership we have built with Sand Embar Kalu, from the Africa International Trade and Commerce Research Center, which is based in Nigeria. Sandembar has been extremely helpful in reaching out to stakeholders from Nigeria and across West Africa. While the pandemic has slowed down the work on advancing the implementation of the AFCFTA, it has not reduced the political commitment of leaders on the continent. Ministers of Trade of the African Union met at the end of September, just two weeks ago, and agreed to finalize the outstanding issues on rules of origin and tariff offers, and to begin implementation of the AFCFTA in January 2021. Leaders of the African Union are to attend a special summit of the AFCFTA on the 5th of December to confirm this determination of the continent. This webinar series is in four parts. The first webinar will focus on, the, the first of uh, three webinars will focus on three regional value chains. Today, we'll be talking about pharmaceuticals, healthcare, and health resilience. At the second webinar, we'll be discussing the building of cotton textiles and clothing value chain across the continent on the 29th of October. And at the third webinar, we will be talking about agriculture, food processing, and food security on the 11th of November. The fourth webinar, which is scheduled for the 24th of November, will be attended by the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area, Mr. Womke Lemene. We have also invited some of Africa's leading thinkers and policymakers 
to engage with the Secretary General on the outcomes of these webinars and the implications for the AFCFTA. For each of the four webinars, we have invited stakeholders representing the productive sector, trade unions, NGOs, think tanks, academics, and policymakers. Today, we are very pleased with your overwhelming response to this call. We have just over 200 participants that have registered for this webinar from across the continent today. I am very grateful to our keynote speaker today for readily agreeing to participate in this webinar series. He is an outstanding leader in his own right, a policymaker and an outstanding academic of global standing. He not only became a mayor of one of Africa's great cities, Addis Ababa, he also became the best African mayor in, in two, 2006 and was the finalist for the Best World Mayor Award. He still serves as senior minister and advisor to the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, a position he has enjoyed for over two decades. During, during this time, Ethiopia became a leader in Africa's industrialization. In addition to all of these roles, he has found time to complete a PhD in development studies at SOAS in the UK, work as a research associate at the University of London, and publish several outstanding and path-breaking research works on Africa's development. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, my brother Faisal, and uh, for your nice words. Uh, first, let me thank the Mandela School of uh, Public Governance and uh, all other partners for organizing this excellent series on a central and core issue on Africa's industrialization and also AFC, FTA. We have, I think, uh, to cope with this uh, difficult uh, acronym, uh, AFC, FTA. Uh, and, and I believe uh, uh, this series will contribute to uh, concretizing uh, the, uh, the broad vision of the continental free trade among African countries, as well as the initiative for economic transformation across the continent. Uh, today, I will focus on three issues. I think three uh, aspects have been mentioned in today's uh, uh, discussion. Uh, the first one is the AFC, FTA. Uh, I would like to reflect uh, in relation to uh, industrialization initiative and uh, policy making. Uh, the second aspect is the industrial transformation or industrial policy, which uh, Faisal uh, now highlighted, which is quite critical. And the third aspect is the COVID-19. COVID-19 has changed a lot and the changes are quite fundamental, but uh, COVID has not changed everything. Uh, for instance, uh, government policies and responses may not have to change completely. Actually, what we have seen during this uh, uh, 10 months of uh, COVID pandemic is countries which, are, which have experience in industrial policy making have been much more effective in responding to the pandemic, as well as the economic recession. Uh, and we have seen countries who lack this tradition and who have weaknesses in government coordination and uh, policy uh, making have been, uh, we have observed them uh, quite having difficulty to uh, manage uh, and cope with COVID-19. Uh, so what we have learned during this uh, COVID-19 is that uh, uh, industrial capacity has been quite critical on the health emergency side, as well as uh, rebounding uh, again from this uh, recession. Uh, but we also see that uh, government effectiveness and policy responses had made the fundamental change. So the COVID-19 is a third pillar which we need to understand. These three 
major issues, pillars are interlinked. On the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement, I would like to highlight that uh, AFC, FTA is not an end by itself. It's usually considered the signing of this agreement as an important uh, and final uh, uh, challenge. Actually, it's the beginning of the journey towards uh, a much more uh, developed trade and actually economic transformation. So we have to see AFC, uh, FTA as not an end by itself. And in order to make it impactful, we need to understand its impact on the supply side, on the demand side, and we have to link it with the nature of industry and with the shifting external environment. It's only with this context that we can really understand the dynamics of uh, uh, AFC, FTA. Uh, in addition to this, and I appreciate that uh, the uh, Mandela School of Public Governance has come up with concrete sectors because industrialization, economic transformation is about sectoral transformation. Uh, and, and looking at the specific industry and sector is so important uh, to understand uh, the dynamics. The COVID-19 uh, has shown us as the recent uh, uh, last week's report of the World Bank shows, Africa is now facing uh, uh, economic recession for the first time in the last 25 years. And, uh, and the contraction of the economy is uh, about minus 3.3. Uh, uh, so the effect on the economic side has been quite significant, but it has also implied changes in the way we work, the way we live, and also the way we organize uh, production. Uh, as part of this uh, introductory uh, note, I would like first to highlight the uh, key perspectives on industrial policy. Having this perspective is so important in order to design the appropriate uh, policies. One key point is we should not understand industrial policy to be a government intervention. It's not about government intervention. Actually, we have to see it, industrial policy, as uh, a vehicle for structural transformation, for technological learning and catch up. And we have also to link it always with the strategic importance of exporters. And these are quite critical for pharma industry as well. The second uh, pillar we need to understand on perspectives of industrial policy is uh, industrial policy on its own cannot have an impact. It has to be connected with the other uh, policies. I'm here in particular looking at policies related with infrastructure, uh, policies related with human capital, policy related with uh, macroeconomy among issues that are critical to uh, impacts of industrial policy. Uh, without understanding this uh, connection, without having this coherence, industrial policy will not have much impact. A third aspect uh, on the industrial policy perspective we need to understand is industrial policy should be seen as adaptive. It has to be adapted to external environment. It has to be adapted to the local condition. And it has to be adapted also to the specific sectoral situation uh, because even if the industrial policy have showed positive Im impact, it means that the instruments must be changed and uh, there is a new uh, a need for a fresh approach. And the fourth aspect is for a practical uh, practicality of industrial policy, we need to have better understanding of the principles related with industrial policy. I'm here mainly looking selecting fact sectors based on productive criteria, not political criteria. Uh, and also having a sectoral approach, understanding and focusing and having a policy uh, design approach to uh, specific sectors and understanding the structure. 
The second aspect is policy uh, making in industrial uh, transformation is essentially uh, about performance uh, discipline, about reciprocity. Uh, things are not going to happen uh, and to bring results. We deal with different uh, industrial groups, with different interest groups, and, and uh, changing their behavior is linked with uh, performance discipline and reciprocity. And the other aspect is the state private sector role. It has to be seen uh, as a moving arrangement, not as a fixed arrangement. At some stage, the state may play an important role in a sector, but gradually the private sector may, be, uh, may evolve to play a much more dominant role. So we have to see it in a way, uh, in a very dynamic uh, way. Coming back to pharma, uh, pharmaceutical industry first, when we talk about pharma, we have to be quite clear about the segments within the pharmaceutical broader pharma industry. Uh, we can talk about medical devices, uh, devices. we can talk about uh, pharmaceutical products, uh, veterinary uh, products as well uh, are sometimes uh, closely linked with this. Healthcare uh, also as, uh, uh, as a service is also linked with this pharma industry. So having a differentiated approach is quite important. Pharma industry is one of the areas that has a huge dilemma for many governments. Ethiopia is a very good example here. Uh, the government has been supporting the pharma industry. The pharma industry is very, very weak, even in contrast to South African indust uh, pharma industry, which uh, accounts uh, one fifth of uh, Africa's uh, uh, 30 billion uh, industry. Uh, and and uh, almost 80% or 85% of medical products are imported. And the three important countries within this continent that are strong in pharma are South Africa, Egypt, and uh, Morocco. Uh, so uh, it, it has been quite difficult to transform the industry. And in 2016, the government uh, adopted a new approach to look afresh to this issue. And the main shift has been, first, uh, we said uh, uh, we need to study anew. We need to do research. We need to design policies on an understanding of the industry's constraints by engaging the private sector, understanding the strategic implication. And the new uh, understanding now is that uh, we have to see pharma industry as an issue of national security. Uh, and also we have to shift from the previous approach of import substitution towards an approach where it also combines exports. And also we need to understand about other countries, how they were able to, uh, to transform uh, pharma industry. And the government studied, especially India, which has a very uh, successful experience. We also studied uh, South Korea and uh, Singapore, uh, as well as China. And from these countries, if we see especially what India did, and I believe uh, 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 Ambassador Faisal will be uh, highlighting later, one of the key breakthrough for India has been uh, by uh, focusing on the generic products as well as uh, being able to use trips uh, in order to uh, develop this industry. So the international experience study was an important input for the policy on pharma industry. And the key pillars we basically uh, put uh, in this uh, new policy approach in 2017 was that we need to focus on uh, larger uh, companies, manufacturers uh, as a source of productive investment who are also involved in exports. And secondly, also we must build an industrial ecosystem for the pharma. So uh, a project was initiated uh, costing about 260 uh, million US dollars uh, financed from World Bank loans to develop a pharma uh, industrial hub in Addis Ababa, which is now completed and, and it has been prepared uh, with the highest standard. And so the park, Clinton Industrial uh, Park is uh, designed with uh, GMP compliant and sustainability as key elements. 
and promotion of uh, API, uh, boosting API has also been considered as critical, active pharmaceutical ingredient, because without that, uh, it's impossible to uh, ensure the growth of pharma industry. It will be limited to formulations. Uh, another key pillar has been uh, the talent, uh, developing the talent uh, and uh, changing also the courses in universities in terms of human uh, resources development and also developing bioequivalence uh, excellence uh, centers. Without this, it's impossible to develop pharma industry. Uh, the government's purchase policy had to be changed uh, because previously it was based on annual and one of the key policy recommendations was that the procurement should be shifted towards three to five years uh, uh, purchase so that uh, companies can plan in advance. And also companies who are uh, active in exports with a minimum 30% exports, they will be given additional incentives. The development of the pharma industry has also been linked with the export logistics. As we all know, uh, the pharma products are uh, tradable goods and it's uh, a small compact uh, product but high value. So we had to capitalize on Ethiopian Airlines and Ethiopian Airlines was part of the development of the policy of the pharma industry. And it has to continue applying for this IATA CF pharma certification, which it has now basically achieved. Uh, so the export logistics element is quite critical. In terms of exports, we have also noted and understood that uh, regulatory harmonization is a major uh, constraint. Uh, and this relates to IGAD, which is uh, countries around the Horn, Comesa countries, East African community, and also beyond that. So these are the aspects that we need to, to bear in mind, and these were the strategies adapted. It's a working progress, but uh, the approach has been uh, changed at the strategic level, and then the key policy thrusts are the issues which I uh, mentioned. I would like to highlight that uh, an approach to pharma industry will not be applicable to other types of industry. For instance, to light manufacturing. Light manufacturing is completely uh, different. I would like to highlight that the, in terms of definition, when we say light manufacturing, which includes apparel and textile, laser and laser products and other sectors, we are mainly looking at uh, labor intensive industries, export oriented, and which are also linked to agriculture as well as uh, tradable goods. These are the common features of uh, light manufacturing. And in apparel and textile, uh, the government had focused in Ethiopia in attracting massive FDI in this sector. And, and, uh, and uh, in the policy approach, uh, we had to start from understanding the changes and shifts within this industry. We have seen even during this COVID time, speed has become quite critical. Flexibility and building a simple global value chain has been quite uh, useful. So the focus has been on attracting high quality uh, productive investment and building uh, a new generation of industrial parks which are sustainable and specialized parks and uh, uh, building <clears throat> industrial ecosystem uh, and also uh, on attracting anchor firms. Uh, here, uh, the sector is linked with the markets in Europe and markets in the US. Uh, so understanding of the market side is also quite uh, critical. So the approach to apparel and textile is quite different from uh, pharma industry and the constraints are quite different. When we look at uh, agriculture, which uh, uh, Fazer was mentioning, uh, which is part of the series, is if I bring two examples within agriculture related industries in Ethiopia is one is the uh, brewery industry which is linked with expansion of malt, uh, uh, barley malt uh, uh, farms as well. So Ethiopia's brewery industry has been expanding quite fast, growing about 25% uh, annually. And this has encouraged many new breweries to be established and almost all malt was being imported. So in the last few years, uh, the key leading companies uh, in Europe 
the three large uh, malt plants in Holland and in France were approached and the three of them are investing in Ethiopia. So the backward linkage has become quite uh, critical, but the expansion of the local market uh, is, has been a key driver. And the companies which are investing in this industry has been primarily uh, European companies. On the horticulture uh, side, uh, it's mainly an export industry, while brewery is uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, domestic market oriented. Uh, the horticulture sector has also its own unique uh, requirements. And the key element is the importance of air logistics, a dependable air logistics, which it had to be linked with Ethiopian Airlines. As uh, a supply of land has been a critical political issue and uh, uh, the first expansion of this horticulture, industry, uh, horticulture sector uh, has been slowed down with the uh, lack of availability of land. Uh, so land is a critical component and cl the cluster approach will also be useful. Sustainability has increasingly become quite uh, critical in this sector. And, and here it's not any type of uh, uh, approach sustainability that are required, but uh, uh, approaches that are quite friendly to customers uh, requirements and also uh, biological uh, nature of the uh, product is what has been uh, focused. So this is just to show that the approach in pharma industry may not necessarily be uh, uh, applied to other sectors. And, and I'm glad that uh, uh, the uh, series has been designed with this uh, in mind. Finally, I would like to say a few points on uh, the issue of uh, uh, trade constraints, uh, AFC, FTA uh, constraints and implication to uh, the AFC, FTA arrangement. Uh, the first one is uh, that uh, industrial capacity is going to be critical. And here economy of scale is what is going to drive this, uh, uh, the expansion of sectors and to be able to produce at a very competitive price, uh, acceptable uh, standard and also speed to market. So here a key issue we need to see in, the, in building productive capacity is uh, not only about building the production capacity, but also issues linked with economy of scale. Without economy of scale, as these products are going to be that compete with products manufactured in Asia uh, or Latin America or uh, uh, Middle East, uh, it may not be uh, competitive. A second aspect is uh, it has increasingly become critical uh, that vertical and domestic linkages are a condition to ensure uh, uh, the competitiveness in terms of uh, uh, being able to export to other neighboring countries or building the, the value chain. And also with the new COVID uh, uh, shifters, we have seen that there is an interest of diversification from the Asia Pacific Rim to Africa and other regions. And we also see the increasing importance of uh, a sub-regional value chain. What COVID has demonstrated is the difficulties in terms of resilience uh, of this global value chain. The global value chain has been very inefficient, very slow, a lot of wastage, and it has not been able to cope with the, with the new shifts. Even the, the Japanese style, uh, just uh, in time production system was challenged because that also requires some cushion and, and additional approach. So the business models are changing and, and uh, the value chain uh, approach and uh, uh, the uh, domestic linkages are becoming much more uh, prominent. I should also highlight that infrastructure connectivity is a key constraint. Like pharma, it may depend on air transport, but on other goods, it has to, uh, it may depend on, on uh, 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 land transport and land transport is a major constraint within this uh, continent. Regulatory harmonization is critical to pharma 
like uh, cytosanitary requirements uh, may be important for exports at uh, destination uh, markets, but for goods like apparel and uh, textile, that may not be a key constraint. Uh, I think uh, I should end here with uh, a final conclusion. Uh, the AFC FTA must be seen as a complex project, as a journey that demands learning and the pace of learning can improve the policy impact and, and also uh, shorten uh, the difficulties uh, African countries may be facing. Uh, the second aspect is AFC uh, FTA can only be effective and successful if African countries and policymakers focus on industrialization and, and targeting job creation, exports, and uh, in broader terms, economic transformation. And we also need to be aware about the new requirement that has been uh, evident uh, because of uh, COVID-19, ensuring and improving and deepening resilience is going to be critical. If I may highlight one specific example uh, that COVID is, uh, offers us with major challenges, but we also need to understand it's a source of opportunities. Uh, so in the last eight, nine months, uh, the Ethiopian government has tried to look at this COVID-19 as uh, a source of opportunity. So factories have been uh, repurposed, garment factories, apparel companies to produce uh, uh, PPE products uh, and uh, efforts have also been made to establish uh, the manufacturing uh, facility of uh, uh, PCR uh, COVID-19 diagnostics uh, facility, uh, which has a production capacity of about 10 million kits, uh, which has become operational uh, before two months. Uh, so these are new capabilities created and for Ethiopian Airlines, uh, which is an important uh, uh, company for Ethiopian government, uh, as it's a major uh, earner of, uh, uh, from services export, it had to uh, prove its resilience under this difficult condition. The government cannot provide it with a rescue package, so there is no room for any subsidy because the government's uh, Treasury does not have the capacity. So the airline had to shift uh, towards uh, from passenger to cargo uh, and to improve its productivity, to diversify. And up to now, in the last nine months, the uh, Ethiopian Airlines had survived without making any loss, without cutting any salary of employees, without laying off a single employee. And, and it has become an opportunity to improve its productivity and efficiency and to prove its uh, resilience. Whether it will be able to sustain this, it has to be tested in the coming few uh, months or years. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainties, but what I want to put uh, here is COVID-19 is a source of opportunities as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Faisal. Thank you to uh, Dr. Akebe Okube. That was uh, really, I think, an amazing uh, insight that you have reflected. You are one of the few people who typify, you know, the concept of praxis. You integrate the theory and practice. And we hear that in the way you uh, express both the theoretical and conceptual understanding of industrialization, but also your deep experience in Ethiopia and on the African continent, it comes through. So I really think that you um, have given us this webinar and the rest of the webinar series, the inspiration that we need <laughs> to help us apply our minds to how we can industrialize in other parts of the continent. And certainly the Ethiopian experience um, 
has been uh, an inspiration for many of us uh, in Africa, even in a case like South Africa, where we have been deindustrializing <laughs> in many sectors, whilst you have been reindustrializing and advancing your development, and in areas where we have really not succeeded at all, you have been succeeding, like the airlines. Uh, we can learn many lessons from Ethiopian airlines for SAA. So thank you very much for that. I think that the key point that you made was that the AFCFTA cannot succeed unless it facilitates industrialization in Africa. And as you put it, we are embarking on a complex journey and the AFCFTA is a massive opportunity because it's creating and it has the potential to create a massive market for everyone on the continent. You have also said to us that uh, COVID-19, uh, whilst it has created a lot of challenges for Africa, it can be seen as an opportunity. And this is the attitude and the approach that we need to take as a continent about how we can um, use the opportunities and step into those opportunities to advance the development of the continent. So thank you very, very much uh, for your insights. I think that in the rest of the discussion, uh, colleagues uh, will uh, draw on the points you've made and uh, expand and, uh, uh, and um, learn from it. And certainly uh, as we um, get to the end of this webinar, we'll come back to you perhaps with a few questions. So thank you so much to uh, Dr. Akebe for your presentation today, your keynote address. That was fantastic. I would like to highlight that in this pharma industry, it's important to recognize that the government has much bigger contribution than in other sectors. And the reason is quite simple. In sectors like apparel, the government may have to provide support incentive to boost production and exports. When it comes to pharma, because of the government's responsibility in keeping the health, uh, uh, in keeping the health of uh, its citizens, it has uh, additional responsibility as a buyer. Uh, I believe it's similar in many African cases in Ethiopia. The Ministry of Health is the largest uh, uh, buyer of uh, medicines for all clinics, for all hospitals, public. Uh, so this uh, gives uh, uh, important leverage to the government. And when we talk about procurement, uh, as one of the panelists uh, mentioned, uh, especially resources uh, coming through international uh, channels like Global Fund. Uh, the tenders are normally conducted uh, uh, and does not, uh, the tenders do not allow uh, special privileges to be given to local manufacturers. So on the, on the procurement side, the, uh, the government as a buyer this is, I think, a major uh, challenge that needs to be addressed. Uh, the additional element is the government is also a regulator here, a regulator, and there are too many uh, government bodies to be coordinated. So the regulatory role becomes so significant in this area because of the effect on safety. So recognizing this is quite important, and today during this uh, session, uh, the representatives from the private uh, have presented uh, excellent ideas, uh, including Marlon, uh, Shumbuzo, Sam, and others. And uh, such a dialogue and discussion would be useful and a platform uh, of dialogues uh, among players in different countries uh, would be useful. The other point I would like to highlight is uh, Global value chain is important and we need to work uh, on it. But I also feel that uh, if domestic linkages are weak, 
uh, definitely the regional value chain will be uh, based on a weaker uh, foundation. So working on verticality, working on improving uh, and developing the domestic linkages can boost the dynamism of uh, the regional uh, value chain. This is what I would like to say. And uh, on pharma industry, a lot of studies has been conducted by Africa Union, by WHO, UNIDO. Uh, there is quite switch uh, uh, research papers and I find some commonalities. The key issues are outlined in this uh, uh, document studies. And uh, however, when we come to address the specific constraints and to design support schemes, uh, a more uh, focused studies uh, is going to be needed, just not a one study conducted in 10 years, but continuously tracking the changes would be important. As we have seen, COVID-19, for instance, had made a big change on pharmaceutical, while industries like uh, aviation, tourism, has been negatively affected. Pharma industry basically uh, has been the winner uh, on this uh, during this COVID-19. Uh, but uh, whether the specific uh, uh, industry uh, in specific country uh, uh, in, in Africa can benefit from that will depend on uh, a continuous engagement and understanding of the situation. So it's good to recognize this. Uh, element. And finally, let me thank uh, uh, Faisal uh, for your uh, excellent uh, moderation and, and panelists uh, who have been uh, sharing with us quite rich insights. Uh, and uh, I should thank uh, uh, Mabel, uh, who has uh, pulled uh, this uh, uh, workshop and, and uh, many thanks for all partners and team members. Mm -hmm.